you need an offering envelope, just put Ted on the amount you are giving to him, what you're giving to the church, or put everything to the church. It doesn't matter much to me. Whoops. So, anyone need a envelope? Miss Shirley. If you want to give electronically, there's a QR code on the bulletin. You can scan with or hover. How does that? You hover with your camera on your smartphone. All the same language, right? When I was a teenager, I would have thought you were crazy talking like that. So. God gave us Jesus, right? He loved the world, so he gave. So we love God, so we give, right? We don't give so we can get from God or manipulate God or... <laughs> right? We give because we love, right? God gave because he loved. And he continues to give because he loves. So... Praise the Lord. Thank you, Father, that as we give, you make all grace abound to us. So we always, having all sufficiency in all things, may abound to every good work. We give you glory, Lord, in Jesus' name. Um, I think I have last week's announcement. Announcement. Bulletin. Uh, Angela says to the youth, the fire is coming. Emma, the fire is coming, watch out. Emma's back, yay, with the new set of wheels, right? No, not. Oh, dear. Well, that apparently is a story you will tell me in person. <laughs> Bless you. Um, Christopher is here for Kids Church. Angelica, if your kids want to go to Kids Church, Christopher is here. So. Um, next weekend is Hope in the Park with Danny Gokey. Uh, September 11th, Kyle and Nettie Embry will be here. They are missionaries to Nigeria. And then on the 18th, we will start having a 6 p.m. Um, I'll just steal it from Pam W. The hour of power, right? We're just going to get in. We'll sing a song. We'll look at scripture and then we'll just we won't be I will not belabor that time so um, I don't think there's anything else so Ted Nelson how do I introduce you Ted I don't even know um, So Ted, Ted and Georgie have a wild story, but um, uh, they got saved when what? Your kids were real little, right? Or elementary school? You were 40 when you got saved. So there's still hope, right? There's still hope, right, for our 40-year-old friends. Um, it was awesome. And uh, I, I went to school with their boys, and um, then they uh, started Rockwater, and then the boys moved, and you moved, and, well, you started a church. church was an accident <laughs> so um, yeah Ted and Georgie met uh, on is it New Zealand air is that in Sydney Australia yes in the airport so um, just wild stories these two have and 
that his, his you know, Mr. Magoo kind of walks around with a hat over his eyes and just ends up in the right place at the right time. I feel like you've magooed your way into this understanding of the finished work of Christ. And uh, it's been just a glorious thing. Oh, yes, we have to turn on the microphone. Not 100%, but yes. So, Which um, is better. <laughs> yeah, so, so they have quite a legacy and have um, touched lots of people's lives and um, continue to minister in a unique way. Currently, they um, house it and have conversations with um, influential people and point them to the Lord. So we pray for them and they leave the residue of the peace of God in their homes as they um, house it while these people are out of town. So they're kind of Glenn and Judy and my mother and uh, Denny and Chris. Yep, they were all part of. Was that discreet? <laughs> yeah. Okay. <laughs> do you do you do anything discreetly? There. Okay. We should have done this I earlier. Know, I know, Ted. It's I know. okay. I forgot. It's okay. Was it dripping? No, no. <laughs> So, yes, Ted is fairly casual, so as are we. So praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Good morning. <laughs> yeah, my wife and I uh, lived in Warsaw before we met in Australia. We uh, got married in New Zealand. We went back to Australia for a little over a year. And then we had a belated honeymoon in Acapulco, Mexico, and away to the States. Nine months later, we had identical twin boys. So do not drink the water in Mexico. <laughs> and uh, we lived in Houston for five years, and then we had, uh, a couple of years later, we had a, another little boy. And then we moved to Warsaw in 1975. We left Warsaw in 19, or excuse me, 2015. Seven years ago, we were going to move to uh, Nashville. We got sidetracked. Had a daughter-in-law got her excited about house sitting and looking after people's pets. They wanted me to get excited about it. And I had the reaction that this gentleman probably would have. You want me to go live in other people's houses and look after their pets, not going to happen. When you own 49% of the stock in your marriage, <laughs> you do not have the, dis the, the final vote. So we decided to try one. That was 73 house sits ago, seven years ago. We've been all over the United States, one end of Canada to the other. Went to New Zealand for five months, four years ago. Went back two years ago for six months. Um, we've looked after sheep, horse, horses, cattle, dogs, cats, alpacas, birds, fish. What? Tor yeah, we, you know, tortoise. Oh, yeah, yeah, and they have a few birds and whatever they have. Well, they kind of, they're there. <laughs> Chipmunks are just there. Anyway, uh, it kind of gets in your blood after a while, G going to new places, seeing, meeting new people. Uh, I still preach occasionally, you know, a few times a year. Uh, in fact, we uh, usually make it every year to, of all places, Sioux Falls, South Dakota. There's a nice, nice church there. And in fact, we were there three weeks ago and ministered. Um, but uh, anyway, 
I want to talk this morning about the finished work of Jesus Christ. There's a lot of discussion about that. That terminology I was unfamiliar with, as well as a lot of things in the grace of God until, well, we got into grace just over 20 years ago. But with social media, it has exposed a lot of things the good, the bad, and the ugly. <laughs> and But one of the good things about it is it has hooked up a lot of Christians and different groups, and there's been a lot of stuff out there to learn as well as not learn. What I want to do this morning is to throw a, things, a few things at you that the finished work of Jesus Christ entailed. First of all, The Apostle Paul says all he knew was Christ and him crucified. Now, I personally think he had his fingers crossed, but he was making a point, the one thing. Like Curly said, do you know who Curly was, the one thing? Do you know which movie that was out of? City Slickers? Anyway, he kept saying the one thing, but he never told him what the one thing was. But see, Paul did. He told us what the one thing was. Christ and him crucified. The rest, all around there, some of it's very important, some of it's not important. But it's not the one thing. The one thing is Jesus Christ and him crucified. What did that do for us? Oh, well, got us saved when we believe it and receive it. But, you know, if you go back, in the garden, there was two trees. There was the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. There was the the tree of life. Now, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, unfortunately, became manifested shortly, well, at the time that uh, Adam took a bite of an apple that his deceived wife gave him. That's what the Bible says. She was deceived. Anyway, <clears throat> but what that made man aware of was there's good and there's evil. And what that brought about was guilt and condemnation. Because when you did wrong, you, 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 you felt guilty. You felt. So what did Adam do and Eve? They, they went and hid. It wasn't God that hid from them. They hid from God. And God came in the garden looking for him and said, Adam, where art thou? It's not that he didn't know where he was. He wanted Adam to know where Adam was. (laughs) And then what happened years later? Moses went up on a mountain and he was given the ten big ones. And what you could say really was the Ten Commandments spelled out what was good. And if you broke those, that was bad. And Israel lived under that. And the old covenant that God made with them through that law. And then when Jesus arrived on the scene, The four Gospels, talking about the life of Jesus. Now, you under, have to understand that the, I want to try to draw a picture here because this has been confusing for the church for eons. Is the four Gospels were written after the resurrection of Jesus, but they told the story about what happened three and a half years, well, actually and it's more, before the cross, before the resurrection. Now, they were telling of a time of those who are under the law. And the red letters of Jesus in those four Gospels were written 
under the law. Jesus was under the law. And a lot of what he said, you have to think about who was the audience. You know, time, context, who was the audience. He was talking to the Jews. He said, he said I have come but to the lost sheep of Israel. And he was, you know, are we going to cut off our ear, cut off our hand, pluck out our eye? Is that something that's supposed to be in the new covenant? No. What he was doing, and a lot of the things that he said, was he was talking to the Jews to try to get them to realize <clears throat> that they could not keep the law. And then he would switch gears occasionally, especially in the book of John, where he would start talking about the love of God. And the king, and he, in the parables, he'd say, the kingdom of God is like, and he's, he's drawn a picture for the, for the future. So the four Gospels, unfortunately, are put in the New Testament. There's, there really should have been a gap between the Old Testament and the New Testament and putting the four Gospels there, because it's really, it's under the law, but it's a transition, a transition period. Now, let's go another step further. You get into the epistles, you have to understand that Paul, Peter, those guys, they had all been under the law. Their audience, for the most part, not all, but for the most part, were people who had been under the law, and definitely for people who had lived in and amongst people, maybe they were Gentiles, but they had lived in and amongst people who had been under the law. So they were all law-minded. So throughout the epistles, you see them talking about the law and trying to tell, tell you in different ways it has ended. You know, don't go back. Don't do that. And the church has got the same problem. Those same letters are good today because the church, you know, how many in here are Jewish by blood? So I would say to say, all of you are Gentiles. Did you know the Gentiles were never under the law? It wasn't written to us. We, we were never under the law. Gentiles were never under the law. It's for our learning. Romans 15 says everything written four times for our learning. But we were never under the law. Is the law good? The law is holy. There's nothing wrong with the law. It's just that the law is It's gone. It's been done away with. It's obsolete, yes. But we learn from it. But it is not there for our relationship with God. It's not there for our righteousness. There is only one way that you can be righteous. And that is praising me, giving me money. No. <laughs> no. One way. Jesus said, there is one way to the Father, but by me. Faith, righteousness, as we like to call it, is accepting Jesus Christ as your Savior. Now, Romans 8 1 and 2 says, now, or there is therefore now, no condemnation to them who are in Christ Jesus who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me, or us, free from the law of sin and death. What's the law of sin and death? What we were just talking about. It's the law of sin and death. Now, one of the things that I had been taught, and I even taught it one time, is there is now, therefore, no condemnation to them who are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. So I thought, okay, there's no condemnation to me if I don't walk in the flesh, but I walk after the Spirit. That's a poor reading of that, and I'll show you why. There is now no, therefore no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus 
who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit, for the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. Romans 8, 9 says, But you are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you. Now, if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he is not his. You cannot be in the flesh if you're saved. You can do stupid things. Glenn and I, well, our wives think we do stupid things, but they're wrong. <laughs> but you cannot be in the flesh. If the Spirit in Christ lives in you, dwells in you, you got it. Now, <clears throat> Ephesians 2 8 says, you got saved by grace through faith, not of works. Now, I just want to kind of point out that sequence. Grace, faith. Not of anything you do of work-wise or performance-wise, but grace, faith. Now, just, let's just go on. I just want to show that sequence. There are some divine sequences in the Bible. In creation, you know, in John, it talks about all things are made by Jesus. In Genesis, talk about God. Well, the Father generates, he's, he's everything, through the Son, down on earth by the Holy Ghost. The Spirit's in us. We pray in Jesus' name to the Father. Now, just keep sequence, just the word sequence in your mind. In Ephesians 1, 3, it says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. What, what are spiritual blessings? They are blessings that you can't do in yourself. They're spiritual. And you've been blessed with all spiritual blessings, those things that you couldn't do on your own. Now, the Word tells us that we have been made new creations. We've been made worthy. We've been made righteous. We've been made sanctified, holy. And we've been made perfect in Him. How many times have you heard that elsewhere? <laughs> We've heard righteous. But we never... I mean, my wife knows when she's thinking right, how perfect I am. What's that look on your face? <laughs> but see, that's the, pro the battle that we have. We tend to walk by sight more than we walk by faith. And when we walk by faith, that is renewing our mind to who we are in Christ, who our true identity is. And our true identity is we have been perfected by Jesus Christ, by the finished work of Jesus Christ. That's what it was all about, because we couldn't do it ourselves. Now, a new creation. You know, when we got saved, we became a new creation. That's a creation that has never existed before. A new one. 2 Corinthians 5, 17 says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. The etch a, -cat, the, the etch -a sketch was cleared. Started over. New slate. And you know, the new slate is clean. Colossians 1, 12. We're new. Giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us, or in other words, made us worthy, who has. It doesn't say will. It says who has qualified us to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in the light. An inheritance 
is not in the sweet by and by. After you die. The inheritance is after he died. For us today. Righteous. <clears throat> Second Corinthians 5.12 says, he, he, For he made him, God made Jesus, who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. So when you look at your spouses and your children and whatever, and they are, have accepted Christ, they are righteous, no matter how stupid they get. The righteousness of God in Christ. Sanctified. Hebrews 10.10 10 says, By that will we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ every time we confess our sins. No. Once. For all. Jesus is not going to crawl up on the cross every time you confess your sins and beg him for forgiveness. He did it once. Past, present, future. Sanctified. Hebrews 10.10. 10. By that we will have, we will have been sanctified through the offering of of the body of Jesus Christ once and for all. Holy and blameless. Colossians 1.22 In the body of his flesh through death to present you holy, blameless, and above reproach in his sight. What did that? The body of his flesh in death made you holy and blameless. This is my favorite one. Perfect. Hebrews 10, 14. For by one offering, he has perfected for all time those who are sanctified. For all time. It doesn't get much better than that, baby. If it was telling us we had to live righteous and perfect lives... And be as perfect as God, we would uh, obviously have a serious problem. But Jesus did it for us. Now, we need to see ourselves as those children of the Most High God. You know, 1 John 4, 17, this is a verse I didn't see until, I don't know, maybe 10, 12 years ago. It wasn't in my Bible. It just miraculously appeared. I mean, there are some scriptures that I highlighted in black box a lot in my Bible that disappeared. No, <laughs> I, I'm not serious. <laughs> um, but First John four seventeen. This is a big one. As He, Jesus, is, so are we in this world. Ladies and gentlemen, you have the whole enchilada dwelling in here. You know, I'm a little active on Facebook occasionally. And um, about a year and a half ago, I decided to start a website called LocateGraceMinistries.com. And I started going around the, the world, just checking out different things. And I found that the grace message has spread a lot further than our world, that our Christian world, that, you know, the different groupings that we might be connected with. And it is growing for those who have ears to hear. And uh, just a few weeks ago, I found two grace Christian churches in Saudi Arabia, in Jeddah, Saudi Arabia. And they're on, uh, on the website, I put an interactive map with little blue markers, you know, where all the churches are, and you can click on those, and it'll bring up, you know, their website and address and pertinent information, contact. 
The ones in Saudi Arabia, their contact points are in other countries for obvious reasons. But you can contact them indirectly. Um, but I'm sure I have any, I, I, I haven't counted them. I'm guessing I might have at least a couple of hundred on there, or maybe 300. I'm convinced there's even a lot more than that. And the amazing thing about it is most of them are not spirit-filled churches. The Baptist church, and that's a big word, uh, they're having a little bit of a grace revival, so to speak, um, of just the revelation of the finished work of Jesus Christ and the freedom and just, I do not know a bunch of people that are more guilt-ridden and sin-conscious than Christians. And they're the ones that have been set free. But the problem is they have had poor teaching over the years. They just, for some reason, that sin consciousness and that guilt, we kind of feel like, okay, we got to continuously get cleansed of it. Back in the day, I spent some time at the altar squalling and bawling. I remember one time I got so mad at God, he, I could picture him in a fetal position hiding in the closet because <laughs> I was yelling and screaming at him. And, I mean, you know, we go through so many things that are unnecessary. Regardless of the circumstances, he's in here, he loves you, and he's not going to leave you. You and him are stuck, and that's a good thing. That's right. Now, 2 Corinthians 12, 8 through 10 says, Oh, shoot, man, no Packer game. I got plenty of time. 2 Corinthians 12, 8 through 10. Concerning this thing, I pleaded with the Lord three times that it might depart from me. And he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, most gladly, I would rather boast in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities and in reproaches and needs and persecutions and distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. <clears throat> I used to have some problems with that verse. Uh, but it says, my grace is sufficient for me. So, what's he talking about? What's his grace? God wasn't ignoring Paul's pleas for help. He was telling Paul, I've already given you everything you need. And you can be victorious in all situations. Grace is my power that I've given you in the middle of all your weaknesses. So when you're weak on, or you're on your own, I am strong in you. So Paul, stop whining. Stand up. Be a man. Use the weapons and the power provided to you. And see, that's what we need to know is what is this grace and what has it really given us? The word grace, or the word, excuse me, gospel means good news. Grace is good news. Grace is the gospel. It does not, does not need to be softened. It needs to be shouted. It needs to be let loose. It needs to be used. It needs to be understood and believed and received. Titus 2, 11 and 12, through 12 says, For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present age. One of the things that us grace people get accused of is sloppy agape. Um, you know, we... Uh, give people a license to sin, we, whatever, because we tell them all their sins have been taken care of, past, present, future, that sort of thing. Well, if you read that verse, 
what grace does is just the opposite. It gives you the power to deny ungodliness and worldly lust and tells you that we need to live that we should live soberly righteous godly in this present age. The Holy Spirit does not convict the Christian of its sin his their sin. It, the Holy Spirit convicts the world of their sin. The Holy Spirit convicts the Christian of their righteousness. If I can put it this way, you say, you're better than that. You're better than that. Because, see, the, the love of God treats you like a lover would. There is no condemnation in Christ Jesus. The Holy Spirit is not the accuser of the brethren. Someone else is. Other than your wife. Did I say that out loud? <laughs> Romans 1, 16, 17. The Apostle Paul said, I am not ashamed of the gospel because it's the power for salvation to everyone who believes, first to the Jew and also to the Greek. For in it, God's righteous is revealed from faith to faith, just as it is written, the righteous will live by faith. Faith is a gift. Now, we have been given the measure of faith, it talks about all we need is, is a mustard seed of faith. Just a little tiny mustard seed of faith. What it is, is that mustard seed of faith needs to be in the right sand. I went to a school, and I know a couple of ladies in this building that went to the same school, that um, we started trying to have faith in our faith trying to get more faith. And when we felt that we had enough faith, then we were putting our faith in our faith to make things happen. Well, <clears throat> that wasn't an entirely bad thing other than the fact that we had it misdirected. Now, there's nine spiritual gifts. One of them is faith. There's Fruit of the Spirit, one of them is faith. Faith, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to draw you some little pictures about faith for just a second. Just, just hold on with me. Well, I'll just read Matthew uh, 17, 20. It says that if you have faith as small as a mustard seed, you can say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it will move. To move your mountain-sized problem, a tiny grade of faith is, is sufficient. And the disciples thought, well, wouldn't it require, I'm sure they thought, wouldn't this require a big amount of faith? <clears throat> and it's not the size of your faith that matters, but the size of your God. As that expression says, goes, uh, says, it's not the size of the dog in the fight, it's the size of the fight in the dog. And our dog is bigger than any other dog out there. And he's got a lot of fight in him because he's already won. And he's given us the victory. Galatians 5, 6 says, For in Christ Jesus neither circumcision or uncircumcision availeth anything. Basically saying, when you're in Christ, being a Jew or a, or a Gentile uh, avails nothing. But faith working through love. Faith working through love. God's powerful grace is experienced through faith, which works through love. If grace is the power station, then faith is the copper wire through which the current flows. If faith or if, if grace is the tow truck, then faith is the cable that connects it. If grace is the river, then faith is the conduit, the 
the, uh, not the conduit, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, aqueduct by which the water flowed. Now, what is fueled, fueling that faith is love. So grace is everything you need and all the power you need. Faith is powered by love. God is love. So what is that faith powered by? God. So remember I was talking about that divine sequence before? There's another one there. We have grace, faith, love. Faith worketh by love. Not how big, but what it takes. Our God. And what he's done through the finished work of Jesus Christ. He has given us all the power, all the gifts, everything we need. They are fueled by love. God is love. Agape power. That's what you have. They didn't need more faith than the disciples. They just need to know how big their God was as it was revealed through the finished work of Jesus Christ. The things which were with, uh, uh, Luke uh, eighteen twenty seven says, the things which are impossible with men are possible with God. In the new covenant, we put our faith in the finished work of Jesus Christ. The finished work is more about our identity in Christ than anything else. If you don't know who you are, you won't know how to act like you are. You won't know the power that you've had as you are in, in, in Christ. It's, a, it's identification. You don't have to worry about the fact that I'm not worthy. Get over your righteous, unrighteous self or what is self-righteous self. That's what I want to say. Uh, there is a tendency, a default thing, when something doesn't go right, we, we sometimes will say, okay, what did I do wrong? I don't want to tell the story, but I went through a period of my life many years ago where I just asked God, what door did I leave open to let Satan come in and steal this thing from me? And I was in a crash and burn mode. And in my little uh, Pentecostal church that we were attending at the time, we had Sunday night services. And my favorite position was right at the end of the altar after everybody left the church down there, squalling and bawling. And one night, it, it, it sounded like an audible right here in my ear. I'm not sure what it was, but it felt like it. This voice said, let it go. Let it go? I didn't understand that. And it wasn't until years later. Now, the problem got taken care of. Not the way I wanted it to be taken care of. Not as fast as I wanted it taken care of. But it got taken care of. But that verse, my grace is sufficient for thee. That's what, but look, that's what he was saying. Let it go. He had it covered. Get over yourself, kids. But see, we have to walk by faith, not by sight, not by the circumstance. Not by the circumstance. For the weapons of our warfare, in 2 Corinthians 10, 14, are not carnal, but are mighty in God for the pulling down of strongholds. The weapons of our war warfare are what? They're not carnal. They're mighty in God for the pulling down of strongholds. Where are the most of the strongholds at? Where, where do they exist that you might be dealing with? Those are the terms that I use. In, um, those cranial crabs, those victory vipers, those mind monsters, those soul snakes, those things that go, boof, bump in the, in the dark. 
those little bees at night that when they're laying there trying to go to sleep and they've got something going on, they won't let you go to sleep. You need to remind yourself who you are and who's got your butt covered. Easy said, but that's why we kind of keep renewing our minds. Because the world around us gives us all kinds of opportunities to crash mentally. And sometimes it only takes a word. Facebook, well, I, do I want to go there? <laughs> no. Okay. Uh, <laughs> praise God. You know, we need to learn to take the things that we see, we, we hear, whatever, and put them up against the word of God. How do they fit? And it doesn't necessarily mean scriptural things, just in the world. I mean, uh, I'm going to step out on a thing here. Um, I have heard teaching, very convincing teaching, that there is a fiery hell. I have heard very convincing teaching, there is not a fiery hell. A fiery, a fiery torture in hell. That when you die, it's a second death, and you just are annihilated. I have a good, good teaching that there's a future rapture and Armageddon, and I've heard teachings that there's not, that it, or it happened in 70 A.D., or they're somewhere in between, and you got mid-trib, post-trib, everywhere trib, and trip over your trib. You know. The gifts are available, all they uh, died, died with the apostles. I've heard teachings that are convincing on all of those things. The interesting thing is, not all the scriptures in the Bible are used. Just the scriptures that prove that point. So what we need to do with things, we need to be open to learn, but how does it fit with all of Scripture? And the other thing is, if one is true or the other is true, it's going to happen. You can't, you can't change it. <laughs> because it's not the one thing. It's not the Christ and Him crucified. So what I'm saying is, don't get your panties in a wad over things that are peripheral. They could be important. A lot of that stuff is important, one side or the other, but it's not the one thing. And that person that believes way over here and you're way over here on some other issues, you may be next door neighbors for eternity, so you better be nice. <laughs> Just like uh, there's a Baptist friend of mine here in town, a pastor, and we used to have coffee together and talk about different things. And, and our theology is probably as far as the east is from the west <laughs> in most things. But we agreed on the one thing. <clears throat> and I told him, I said, hey, I know there's going to be Baptists in heaven. He said, are you? He looked at me and I said, there has to be, because my mansion is going gonna, is gonna to have gardeners and butlers and cooks. And in a lot of places, those people can't speak the language. <laughs> uh, anyway, um, <laughs> and we remain friends. We remain friends. <laughs> oh, but see, huh? It's like, well, it's like that uh, that that um, Catholic Catholic bishop that heard that there was a woman in South Africa 
that could actually audibly talk to God. And this priest said, I got to go meet this lady. So in not too far distant future, he was able to fly to South Africa and set up an appointment with this lady. And uh, so they visited for a while, and he tried to get her to prove that she was legit. He said, look, why don't we meet back tomorrow, and tonight you talk to God, and you ask God what I said when I went to confession last Saturday. And she said, oh, okay. So the next day they met, and he said, what did God say? She said, well, God said he couldn't remember. You, you know what scripture I'm talking about? He threw your sin as far as the east from the west and remember it no more. So when you confess your sin, you confess it to him for help. And there's a good chance it might, this is hypothetical, well, I don't know, this could, he might say, uh, what's your name, say that again? <laughs> but what I, what I mean, mean to say is, there's nothing wrong with confession of sin and going to God for help, that's the best place you can go. You just don't have to go there for, and ask for forgiveness or squall and bawl and begging for forgiveness or whatever because it has been done. The finished work of Jesus Christ cleansed your slate, cleansed it forever. There's no more blood going to be shed for it. It's made you white as snow. Now, you might have to do some asking forgiveness to a spouse or someone else, and that's perfectly legit but not to God. That's not to God. Father, we just thank you. We thank you that we can get together and we can talk about the finished work of Christ, that we can talk about who we are in Jesus Christ and that the fact that he has given us everything that we need to function in this world. And Father, we just thank you. We thank you, we thank you. And we thank you that our minds will be continuously reminded in, into who we are. And that we don't have to go on any condemnation trips, guilt trips. And even if we get invited, we don't have to accept the invitation. Because we have been set free in Jesus. Amen. Amen. Questions? Concerns? Okay, dang it, it's not even Packer game today. We got plenty of time. It's only 11.30, 11.25. I've never closed that early. Let, okay. Lesson number two. <laughs> Hallelujah. Anyway, I just, guys, don't let the accuser get you bogged down. You've been set free. Life has its own challenges without having to have God for one. Amen. And we all have been through it. Never to return. <laughs> right? Okay. Pastor Lori, can I turn my mic off now? Well, thank you, sir. There's not much more to add, right? Well, I mean, you, we could 
we right we can always talk about the Lord and open up the scriptures, but um, but to remember that God does not accuse you and you are already free, hundred percent. You're forgiven, right? Yep, holy. refresh right to refresh our ourselves yeah all right well father we are so thankful for your written word we thank you that you reveal your truth in those pages to us help us to discern what is for us today and learn from the things that happened in the past Um, lord we give you glory and honor and we know that your grace is always sufficient for us. So whatever it is that we're going through today, we look to you and we say your grace is sufficient. And we ask for your help. And uh, as Hebrews 4 says, we will find grace in our time of need. So we give you glory and honor, Lord, and thank you. Amen.